we pray all right? Okay, let's pray. I, I couldn't get children's ministry and kids and preschool straight this morning. Lord, what a, what a great day. And Lord, we, we thank you that we can gather in your house and you can open our hearts to your word. And Lord, uh, just uh, pray that you bless us as we study that word today. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, before I go on and introduce the, the next vision, which starts in chapter 15, and I know you guys are thinking he's moving slow. Actually, I'm, this is the fastest I've ever moved in the book of Revelation. And you can imagine those other people. Um, but at the end of the last chapter, where is it? Okay, the last chapter, chapter 14, verse 20. Remember I said that there were two judgments. There was the judgment where Christ harvests the believers, and then there's the, the, the other one with the sharp sickle, and they're, they're thrown into the wine press. I just want you to notice something in verse 20. And the wine press was trodden where? Outside the city. Why is that important? Why is it important that it's outside? You didn't want to defile the city? You might not learn. You didn't want to defile the city? <laughs> Say that louder, Tommy. Jesus was crucified outside the city also. And if you go back to chapter 11, the church and the saints are trampled outside the city. God has his day. You know, uh, what, what the, one of the guys that uh, <laughs> Texas County used to say, Pastor, what goes around comes around. Well, but God is true. You know, Jesus, why was Jesus crucified outside the city? Oh, Zell had part of it. What do you mean? Vile bodies inside the city. All right, we make, make the city a clean. They were in the midst of Passover, so they're even more concerned about when they just accept you know, when Jesus came to the temple uh, on his, for that week, they would have been hanging in a cage over the temple. Off, see, the temple, the, the temple mount. And there was the Castle Antonio right attached to the temple with, which, where the uh, Roman garrison was stationed. And at one point, a would-be Messiah, before Jesus came on the scene, they'd come and, and challenge the Romans. Well, they hung him in a cage over the temple and let him die there and rot there. And so when Jesus came to the temple, that body would still have been hanging there um, over the temple. The Romans were not enough people. <laughs> they, wanted, they wanted any other would-be messiahs or Jewish heroes to, to learn the lesson by just looking up and see what happened with the last one. Okay? So some of it, some of it is the unclean. You know, I think I shared with you that, that the reason why um, <coughs> uh, the, the Jews would not go into Pilate's palace. Did I share that with you? Yes. Because yes. They, they, the Romans performed abortion. Stuff like that. And then they made the place unclean. Uh, why? What, 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 what was outside the city? Trash dump. What? What was that? Trash dump. Trash dump. If you go if you go to Jerusalem and you go outside the old city, they, 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 they call it the Valley of Canaan. That's all where the trash dump was in Jesus' day. And so you put the trash outside the city. I mean, sometimes, uh, uh, what's the name? Gehenna. Gehenna. Hell. You know, a lot of times it was just the fire there because they're always burning the garbage. And that's where that's where the image for hell came from. So Jesus is treated as one unclean, and he's crucified outside the city now. <coughs> I'm, I'm way off base here, but I'm just going to share something because my, my mind went there. Um, a lot of times, 
times you picture Jesus being crucified like he's way up high. But Roman law required that the crucifixion be such that people passing by could look into the face of the person in agony. Okay? So that a lot of that, and, and it had to be, it had to be on a well-traveled road just outside the city, so that lots of people would go by and see this. Alright? So it's, it's, it's Romans were, the Romans were cruel. Okay. Someday, when I get to take you all to Jerusalem, I'll, I'll show you. Um, actually, they believe, um, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the sites supposedly were named by the Crusaders or by uh, Constantine's wife. And um, they believe that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is as inside it, is accurate. That it's a, a that eight or nine chance that that's the place where the tomb was, where Jesus was was buried. Okay, and that means it's somewhere near there. Now there's other sites. You know, if you go if you go to Israel, they have two of everything. You know, <laughs> at least they have two. They'll have two places where he was crucified, two places where he was, you can go visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and then you go visit the Garden Tomb, and, you know, we really don't know. But there are certain things they look for to, to authenticate the sites, and a lot of it has to do with looking for a, I forget, it's a, it's a certain kind of, when they dig down and do the, 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 the archaeology, it's a certain kind of church that would have dated from the three, year three or four hundred. And if the ruins of that are there, that usually means that it was placed there for a reason. If the church was built there, that that's probably where it took place. But anyway, Jesus was crucified outside the city. And so when I just wanted to point that out. That, you know, when the scriptures say, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, it's true. Because that's when he describes the judgment, the judgment. And the wine, great wine press of God's wrath, he makes the point, was trodden outside the city. And the blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 stadia. That's quite a distance, guys. Okay, now I got a question for you for chapter 15. Let me get ready for chapter 15. Suppose you're standing there. <laughs> On Judgment Day, someone you love, someone you're supposed to, is put on the left side by the Lord. And he says to them, Depart from me, you are cursed, into the eternal fire. What do you think about that? Hmm? Guilt. Okay. Maybe you feel guilt. Why guilt? Do you think? Okay, you didn't. Maybe the wind is doing.
heaven. Everyone says, Lord, not, be, not unknowing. Because exactly what you said, our hearts are changed. We see things through his eyes finally. And we know you're right. Your judgments are just all together. So I think we imagine the sadness, the guilt. But in the world to come, that's gone. And even at Judgment Day, it's gone too. Because, because think about what in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, when Jesus comes in that moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. So we'll already be in our <coughs> proper state, our redeemed state, at the moment he comes. No. Unless you're not changed. <laughs> anyway, um, so just understand it. Now, this is one of the issues that's going to be dealt with in these last chapters, is that God is right, and he has every right to judge people. Okay? So, you know, you're going to see what... I want you to think. How many seals did we have? Remember? Seven. Seven. And then what did we have after the seals? Not... The seals are... Well, I can see somebody out there thinking... Place of danger. 
danger and threat. Um, you know, they, they were not a seagoing people. Okay? They were a mountain people. They were a desert people, but they were not. If you look where they mostly lived in Israel, it was in the Judean mountains. It was up in the hills. You know, the plains, the Shephelah, the, the, the foothills and the Shephelah, uh, and then the plains, um, that's where the Philistines lived. Okay? In fact, um, does anybody know what, um, what tribe Samson was of? He was the tribe of Yeah, 
Egyptian dead lying along the sea. Where, what, what, what um, God is wanting us to see, Revelation 15, is a picture of us standing on the right side of the Red Sea, <coughs> on the other side of God's judgment. And notice what we sing. Go back to Revelation 15. Great. Amazing are your deeds, O Lord, God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. Your righteous acts have been revealed. We will stand there in heaven and say to God, You are Right. And there'll be no doubt about it. And that's the picture here. Standing on the other side of judgment, saying, You're right, you're hope, you're just. You know what you're doing, and we don't. It's the thing that we resist doing right now. You know, I, I you know that there's a passage in Philippians where it says, uh, Therefore God has highly exalted him, right? Philippians chapter 2. And placed on him, Jesus, the name that is above every name. That in the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some willingly. Others unwillingly. We're going to see a lot of this in the next chapter. The, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the unbeliever will have to, but it won't be willing. Even then. And one of the things you're going to see in these chapters is that the unrepentant go to hell. Unrepentant. That, that, and think about, we're going to talk about plagues when we get to chapter 16 here. I'm going to ask you, so be thinking about this. Anyplace else that we know where plagues take place? Just now, don't answer now. I know you know the answer, but I just want you to think about it. Okay? Because remember, the Old Testament is extremely important to us. So we're going to stand there and say, God, you're amazing, even as the judgment happens. And you're right, you're holy, you're just. Glory be to you. <coughs> we like. Almighty God, who can fix things, right? I want you to look at the call of Jeremiah in the first chapter of Jeremiah. Always keep your finger on Revelation.
to, to set his head like a flint. Right? So that so he can break the hard hearts of the Israelites. You know, sometimes, sometimes that's what God has to do in our lives. Sometimes he has to break our hard headedness. You know, they <coughs> Seminaries and also Pat Ferry, who's my boss at Mequon. His, his dad, this man, this man could go on a roll. He, he, could, he could quote, he didn't have to have his Bible in front of him. He could, he could quote the whole scripture by memory. Okay? And he would, he, in the Bible class, it was just like, okay, and it was all it was all scripture, but he could also get on a roll with jokes. It just would have, and Pat couldn't get to a, a meeting in Florida once, and so Seleska had to give up and give the opening. So he gave an only monologue, and, it was, and he was Polish, so he told one Polish joke after another. And he got all these German Lutherans laughing their heads off, and then he said, oh, by the way, do you know that they, they don't use tombstones in Germany anymore? And they said, why? He said, because they, they just buried the Germans with their heads above ground. <laughs>
slip, and then sanctuary, the heavens opened, and came forth these seven angels, and they got, they, they're dressed, they're clothed in pure, bright linen, and so it's, it's shining, it's so clean, with golden sashes, which is kind of the symbol of a priest, the servant of God, uh, across their chest, and one of the four living creatures, right, gave to the seven angels golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever, and the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Does this remind you of anything from the Old Testament? <clears throat> Couldn't go into the Holy Land until the Israelites were purged of their former sins. Okay. Think of think of this as called a tent of meeting. What kind of tent did they have? Well, the tabernacle, the whole tabernacle. Holy was filled with smoke. And when it was filled with smoke, God was there. And Moses could not enter. No one will be allowed to interfere with God's work. Nope. Until he's finished. It's, 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 it's quite, you know, if you, when you understand the imagery, the book of Revelation is quite dramatic. I mean, can you think of another time when the, uh, you, if those of you are, I'm going to test you people from the early service today. Um, late service people, you're off the hook. What was the first reading about? Alex is good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah, it's chapter 6. What happens in chapter 6? <laughs> okay, yeah. Isaiah walks into the temple and he sees God on his throne and it says, I mean, that the imagery here is powerful. It says that, 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 that the train of his robe filled the temple. And, and there are angels, seraphim, and cherubim flying to and fro with six wings, covering faces and back and forth. And, and I love Isaiah's reaction. What does he do? I'm not worthy. I'm not oh, that's, you know what he does. Whoa! <laughs> Did I come at the wrong time? <laughs> right? Because he, he says what, what Mike said. He says, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord. Now, I'm, I want you to, uh, I'm, I want you to, I'm going to show you something. <laughs> I'm going to find, I think you'll find it here in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, John is writing about when Jesus had said these things, learn about verse 37 or 36, um, he departed and hid himself from them. This is his, this is his after he's entered the city. And then John is writing, it's not the words of Jesus, though he had seen many signs before them, they still did not believe. So the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord was believed, he said another thing. Then look at verse 41. Isaiah said these words because he saw his glory and spoke of it. If you're wondering, what did Isaiah see in the temple? Because the Bible says no one has ever seen God in the So how did Isaiah live? John gives us the clue. Isaiah spoke of these things because he saw his, and the Greek word his there refers to Jesus. Saw his glory. This, he sees the pre-incarnate Christ. I just wanted to show you that. The scriptures are, if you read the scriptures, they, they're full of, of information. But anyway, so he goes in and, and it's not that he burns his lips, but in Isaiah, Mike, he takes a coal from the altar of burnt offering and he touches it to Isaiah's lips so that he would know that he's forgiven. And it's by that grace. 
grace and the forgiveness that Isaiah can then answer, here am I, and send me to me. That's the same kind of picture that's right here of God and his glory. I mean, can you think of a time in the life of Jesus when this happened?
And remember, what is Pharaoh to Moses? Now he's an enemy, but what was he? He was a, a, a stepbrother. He grew up in the same family with Pharaoh. He had been loved by Pharaoh's father and uh, by Pharaoh's daughter and so forth. So you've got to remember, Moses is called to go speak hard words to family, knowing that they won't listen. Well, you're going to see in this whole chapter that the, the, the people of the earth are going to react the same way. It says, so the first angel poured out his bowl on the earth, right? And what happened? Our bowl source, right? Broke out, painful sores broke out upon the people, bore the mark of the beast, worship the slab. Um, the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like blood. And I want you to notice this. There's no fourth or third. Every living creature died. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became and I saw the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they... And I heard the altar say, Yes, Lord Almighty, true and just are your judgments. And then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. So here is scorching fire. Now, in the Roman world, who is the god of the sun? Not agree. Pallas, I believe. Look here. I think it's Pallas. I got it in my notes. Let's see. Verse eight is another. Yeah, is a, is a is a is an assault on the Roman god Apollo. By the way, did you notice? Did you know something here? Some of these things are things that the Egyptians worshipped. Frogs. Okay? The sun. God is making a point to the Egyptians who is really God. That's part of the point of the plagues that are listed here. It's God is saying, he's telling them, the thing you worship as God is not God. The policy ain't going to help you. Okay? But I want you to look here at verse 16. I swear I don't want to finish. It's kind of a hard note. But they, they were scorched by fierce heat. And look at what happens in verse 9. They cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. And they did not repent or give him glory. By their response, they will show that his judgments are just. Any questions about this? We're kind of close, not at the end of time, but close to Sustain my hand, I require from my hand. If you look at the world around us, Think in your own life. How hard is it for the world around us? How hard is it for you for us to admit what's wrong? You know, one of, the, one of the things that often happens is that instead of admitting we're wrong, we get what? We get angry. I find, have you ever found yourself doing that? And then when you thought about it, because hopefully you realized 
repentance in every household. <laughs> the point is, whatever these things are, those who reject Christ will go to judgment. So folks, the one thing I'm going to try and turn a little bit. Yes, we're, we're sent to talk to stubborn, hard-hearted people about Christ. But there is one who can change their hearts. And that's the Holy Spirit. And so that's why we go. Because we're so hard-hearted. God was just using you, right? <laughs> right? To bring you to repentance. Soften your heart. What's that old saying there? But by the grace of God, why? Don't ever think. Don't ever fool yourself into thinking, I could never be like that. Yes, you can. Reaching your nods to work with the Holy Spirit. I will tell you, people ask me about this all the time. One of the things that came out of my, in my mind, that came out of my three years in Germany, they are wonderful people. If it could happen there, it can happen anywhere. It can happen twice. If it can, if it can, they can, if they were capable of the evil that happened, it can happen anywhere. And we dare not let down our vigil or think that it can't happen among us. But what does the scripture say? Man's heart is evil all the time. And so we claim the only thing that's saved. share with them the fact that you loved us that way.